Kia ora koutou katoa. Welcome to The Hoon, where co-host Peter Bale and I go around the week's news in geopolitics and Aotearoa's political economy with a whole bunch of experts, academics and politicians, all to understand our worlds better and have some fun. Kia ora e tu iwi and welcome to The Hoon on Thursday the 11th of April. I'm Bernard Hickey and co-host Peter Bale. Peter in Hoon Bay. How are you? I, How are you? I, I see you You seem to have a new sort of camouflage backdrop. Is this, is this where, where are you in Greece or somewhere that you've got a no, sort no, of white I'm, backdrop? I'm, that... I'm, I'm coming in hot, nice and stealthy. Uh, new, yeah. a, new, a different room in the it's house good. to try to get some extra uh, sound quality. I'm all about the audio now, and um, yes, me too, me too. Mm, mm, and this is a nice, nice room in which tell. get some afternoon, <laughs> afternoon sun. It is lovely to see you. Um, Although as, not today. I wondered if because we're getting ninety mile ninety mile an hour winds this afternoon, ooh. and there's a thunderstorm warning from midnight, from about twelve o'clock. And not, not to turn this into the um, Actually, we could we could try and topple RNZ from its role as the civil defence um, organisation. Yeah, well, uh, that's, that's, we? that's one of those interesting um, topics as um, radio and television networks try to dis disconnect themselves from these old school um, broadcasting networks that are exactly what we need whenever we have a mm. disaster. Mm. Um, exactly. And we'll, we'll talk about that uh, later on the show. We've got a cracking show uh, this week with uh, our, our regular weather report or climate report actually from um, Catherine Dyer uh, coming up from 10 past 5 to 20 past 5. We'll have Robert Patman um, talking about Gaza. Our world, world weather report. Yeah. World, world political weather report. Yeah. Yeah. And increasingly the climate and the geopolitics come together. Um, and then it's getting quite hot, yeah. Yeah, mm, and we'll we'll worry no doubt about whatever's flying around in the atmosphere between Israel and Iran. And then at five thirty-five, we'll talk to Maria Mililati, who is the co-director of the AUT's journalism program and has just put out a trust in journalism um, uh, report, which you've written a, yeah, a piece about. Yeah, which of course has coincided rather dramatically with the situation at News Hub uh, and TVNZ. So we're going to have Paddy on later as well. So we have two chunks of media um, and, and maybe you and I'll talk about the media a little bit in our little top of the, top of right. the session chat now. And we'll also be talking about um, lobbyists. You know, if there's less mm. watchdogs around with less journalists, might be nice if uh, the lobbyists are a bit more regulated. Fewer, Bernard, fewer. Jesus Christ, we're going to have to watch now soon too. Well, all the editors have gone, of course. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, and then, so we'll be talking about the lobbying code, which has been watered down this week with Holly Bennett from Afi Group. Um, and she, mm. we've had her on the show before. She's always uh, She's fantastic. She's great, yeah. Mm. So, uh, yeah, quite... I'd, a... I'd lobby to have her on a bit more, actually. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I, I, mm. I'd agree with you there. Um, and uh, she, she'll be great. So, quite a, a show. And it's been, an, frankly, an awful week to be in the media. Um, worked out today that in one day yesterday, 20% um, of New Zealand's journalists were sacked. Oh, actually, that's a very interesting. You should bring that up with uh, with mm. Mira as well. That is a mm. very interesting number because I was thinking about that. It must be quite a chunk. It is. A, mm. It is quite a chunk. And then I was thinking about the staff at um, at Stuff and the staff at New, um, NZME, and that is. You're right. It's a very chunky number. Although, are you are you including all of those people at News Hub as uh, journalists? Because I think. You know, a lot of them are doing other things as well, aren't they? I mean, well, um, but, it's, but a pretty significant chunk. You're right. Yeah, if you if you count, you know, all of the camera operators and editors and those people who run the systems, um, then uh, we're talking 380 people who were made mm -hmm. um, or who were confirmed as confirmed as being made redundant yesterday. Um, the closure of Sunday and Fair, Fair Go, two of the most active and long-running investigative journalism operations mm -hmm. in our country. Um, News Hub doing plenty of investigative journalism itself. Um, Michael Mora, for example, mm -hmm. not to mention Paddy Gower, um, uh, have been pumping them out day after day. My estimate is that of the full-time paid investigative journalists in New Zealand at the end of last year, 
two thirds of them have gone so far this year, with the demise to of what? to what Bernard? To you mean to Substacks or just to shut down, to lobbying, yeah, or, or lobbying or corporate mm. PR. Um, for example, uh, the Stuff Circuit team, which did some great work at Stuff, mm -hmm. has been quietly disbanded. Um, there have been um, uh, fewer people working at the New Zealand Herald on this stuff. Obviously, with the demise of Sunday and Fair Go, that's TVNZ's investigative journalism gutted. And uh, mm. obviously, um, the uh, 60 Minutes program, which was at TV3, was shut down a few years ago and is still there in reduced form at Newsroom. In reduced form, yeah. yeah. I, th I think this is, this is I, I tried to make this point in my little post today on my Substack, Bernard, about we can come across as being very self-serving when we discuss these things. But the reason is because we believe the work matters. We have plenty of experience in knowing that the work matters, that we're not all writing uh, what happened on married, married, what's it called? Uh, marry, fuck, marry, fuck, kill, or is that what my, no, my, no. That's what my daughter used to play? Marry, fuck, kill, a game no, no. at private Ma school in England. Married without very, journalists. <laughs> Yeah, married without journalists. Um, so that game, you know, that, that we, we're not all doing that kind of thing and we're not all reporting what's the latest thing that's said in, in TikTok or social media. And some of these big stories, like Michael Mora did very good jobs of some of the, uh, my recollection is some of the questions around COVID at a time when people felt that the media was being a little too too cosy or, or not necessarily aggressive enough in... Uh, questioning what the government was doing, he did a very good job. Um, yeah, I think I think calling out the what's what's missing or what's likely to be missing is a problem. And as I sent to you yesterday, I thought because a couple of weeks ago I mentioned on this Bernard that we I'd heard it uh, a thing that Carmen Parahi was doing, the a, a sort of rejoinder that I'd thought of, not in this way that we need to think about who wants the media to be weaker, who wants to believe. Mm -hmm. that it lacks credibility, who wants to believe that we're all part of an agenda. And to see ACT yesterday publish its version of the uh, AUT trust thing and then say, do you trust the media to tell us what we, what your representatives are doing? Mm -hmm. Sign up for our email. I thought was profoundly cynical, typically cynical, but profoundly cynical and just incredibly ill-judged. Well, not just that, but short-sighted. I mean, true libertarians understand the value of a free and active and robust media. And to dance on the grave of 20% mm. of New Zealand's journalists and to argue that somehow this is a good thing and that everyone will be better off um, just uh, is the most... Um, cynical. Uh, mm. <laughs> cynical, but also... Um, short-sighted and um, unwise thing to say uh, I no, mean but I think once you've once you've created once you've created yourself as a sort of single point of truth you know we've we've seen this through Trump we've seen this and, and, you know, and David Seymour as we've discussed before is incredibly skillful at this you know there are certain things he does as a politician that, that you have to admire but the cynicism of this and the risk of it and, it, and you know everybody who listens to this that we've got 101 people on they listen to us regularly, hopefully, and they understand that we are self-critical and that I've been critical of media in New Zealand quite a lot on the show, and you've pulled me up on a couple of issues. But, you know, the gap in there of quite important stories, if you think about, you know, some of the work that's been done on mental health in New Zealand, Lake Alice, that kind of stuff, this is all at risk. You know, it's not just no. um, the evening news. That's right. I mean, you and I have both... Uh, and we both understand and have run investigative journalist operations. Um, I'm a shareholder in Newsroom still. Just for example, yesterday, three years after mm. the government, um, the Ministry of Social Development and the courts uh, used the court system to um, shut down uh, the publication of a video about uh, reverse uplifts by Oranga Tamariki. Yep. Three years after that was shut down, the... Uh, court of Appeal overruled um, uh, a court ruling so that it could be republished. And this is yeah. a piece of journalism which made a force to major changes in the way Oranga Tamariki deals with um, uplifts and was um, absolutely you know, crucial and hopefully improving things it was. there, or at and, least and exposing. Bernard, I just think, how much did it cost um, Newsroom, do you think, to contest that? 
I, well, I would say a minimum of 50 grand. Minimum, yeah. absolute minimum. And yeah. I imagine it would have got quite a lot of pro bono help. And that was... The, the, the difficult thing about that to me is not only was it dramatic overreach by Oranga Tamariki, which we know is a kind of failed enterprise and just to some extent. Also, you know, it's always doing a difficult job and pushing shit uphill some, somewhat. But it was a tremendous piece of overreach by the Solicitor General. And I think she has... She has questions to answer that we are not going to hear because you just don't have no. senior civil servants, senior legal people like that, actually facing questions. In fact, why don't we try and get her on to have a chat about that? Yes, that's quite possible. I actually went to high school with her. Um, Did you? Yes, yes. Um, but ah. um, yes, that's a good idea. Um, and I know as a former director of Newsroom and shareholder... Una Dragos, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry to everybody. I was... Um, I was forgetting Una Gujagosha's name. Yep. Carry on. Um, I, as a director and a shareholder, I saw um, uh, what it meant and uh, knew that um, when legal action happens, immediately the clock starts ticking. And for every legal action, basically, you, you judge them in terms of journalist salaries. Mm -hmm. And, you know, every $100,000 in legal action is a journalist that you're not employing. Um, every yeah, risk, or, risk or, or of a, every thirty-five thousand in New Zealand, but yes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and and every um, every journalistic action where someone is accusing you of something and threatening to take your house off you is a real thing, and to yeah. be and it's also time, Bernard. It's time mm. too, mm. time mm. and worry and stress and that's, uh, that's why you... and an understanding of what matters. So I, I I I have been really surprised, not surprised actually, I haven't been surprised because I've been. As you know, occasionally spending a little bit too much time on social media lately, particularly on X. And the shipments of bile that are arriving in New Zealand from overseas are entirely intact. You know, there's there's a there's there's a refinery somewhere that is delivering bile to the bloodstream of a lot of New Zealanders that is extremely unpleasant. Yeah, and, and it's, it's come it's... full force with Paddy. Yeah. <laughs> and used to yeah, yeah, no, it has, uh, and there was plenty of people out on uh, various places, various platforms, celebrating the stuff mm. uh, yesterday, which was, um, I mean, I shouldn't be shocked, I've been there before, but, uh, you know, it's quite a thing. I, I don't think people understand what it's like to live in a society without a free media. You and I have reported from places where um, journalists are harmed, hurt, imprisoned, where people are afraid of um, saying what they think in public. Um, we're very naive and complacent mm. in, in New Zealand. And um, I think uh, it's been a bad week. And I, I don't have the answers, obviously, <laughs> obviously, apart from um, looking to find a way to get... Well, apart from camouflaging your under under a sort of um, oh, yeah. you know, camouflage. No one, no one will find me here. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, and trying to um, uh, build up some journalism funded by uh, subscri subscribers, and that has that has worked so far. I wouldn't so pretend far. so far, and I wouldn't pretend yeah. that it's the solution for everyone. But um, I certainly hope that a lot of those people who are now without work and and also unable to have a a base to do their work um, can find various platforms and ways to do it and that people get mm. involved because as we saw this week the government won't um, I don't know if you saw those quotes from Melissa Lee saying you know well with it with does she actually give any quotes or did she just say I've got a report and I've got an analysis but I'm not going to tell you anything about it because I don't really know what I'm talking about that, so that, she, was she, was was asked, average, she was asked she was asked in Parliament um, is there anything you can do to, to save the media and she said no I can't save it uh, which is not strictly true well in that she has she's yes also yes. but saving saving is a different thing from not uh, adding to the problem yes and and apparently she had a bunch of proposals in front of cabinet which um, are uh, um, which uh, have been blocked by Winston Peters, and mm. who isn't considering them because he's According busy, to Tova. busy yeah. at the UN. Yes, um, mm -hmm. and also uh, Shane Jones acknowledged that um, things wouldn't be dealt with until the Rangatira came home. Um, mm -hmm. So um, this is a, a case where things could have been done. The government could have, for example waived the courier fees for um, mm -hmm. TV3 
and TVNZ for that matter. And uh, that would have uh, certainly made a difference. And you've got to remember, the last time Warner Brothers came to New Zealand and said to the government, give us some money to s save an industry, um, the then national government did just that. Uh, the, um, the fear was that the Lord of the Rings would go away. So we um, Lord of the Rings. Yes. And so uh, a whole bunch of government money was given to Warner Brothers to run Lord of the Rings. But when it comes to news, not so keen. So um, we shall see how that goes. It looks like we're having some technical problems. Well, just I, let's, I mean, let's Catherine. see if Catherine, because I noticed I got a let's Catherine. Can you hear us? No, it doesn't look like God, um, it's like that one with. The, I mean, I hate this on the BBC and on RNZ when it happens. So we're just yep. going to have to ad lib the entire thing. Yep. So um, Bernard, I mean, it's been the warmest, warmest uh, March on record, which is the I think the 10th month in a record globally. Um, that's that's you know been a record temperature and we've now broken through one and a half degrees yes um the 10th month running of record high temperatures according to copernicus which is the eu's uh climate and um weather uh research agency uh we've also got research which we're going to talk about with uh, catherine and which we'll include in the weekly wrap that mm. goes out with a video i've just recorded with her talking about a 38 degrees celsius increase in temperature in a part of uh, east antarctica in 2022 and signs mm. that the uh, art, the uh, polar ice caps are melting faster than expected. There's a debate, a really active debate right now between the real climate scientists, the real climate scientists, about whether we have gone through tipping points, uh, which mean that the heating of the planet is going to accelerate dramatically. Certainly, when you um, look at what's happened in the last year and a half or so, things look like they've broken. Uh, we're certainly seeing a much faster uh, melting of uh, the Greenland ice sheet, the West Antarctic mm. ice sheets, much faster heating of the, particularly the North Atlantic and the Mediterranean, um, record temperatures and um, uh, real problems with um, major weather events. We see them every day. And mm. uh, for example, um, we're now seeing um, massive problems with insurance, uh, which yeah, yeah, the real the real world implications, because I, mean, I was quite struck as you, you've been Bernard. I mean, we, we, I, I like you have been looking at some of the, you know, the Copernicus stuff and the very serious, um, sober climate scientists. And they're not calling panic, but they're saying, hang on a minute, this is a tad worrying. It's not going to what the, to the model that we expected. We don't know yet whether it's all El Nino driven. And of course, as, Ka as Catherine very capably has talked to us about before, the um, you know the 1.5 degrees is a decadal thing. So you know, from the for, in terms of sort of breaching the whole Paris Accords, that takes you know you've got to be measured over that way for a decade. But this kind of breakdown, the way you know the, this idea of climate breakdown appears to be a little alarming at the moment. Although, in my rather irritating week of um, spending too much time at three o'clock in the morning looking at X. Uh, I had an encounter with somebody who brought up the issue of um, of uh, acid rain and how, of course, we'd all been terrified by that, but it had turned out to be nothing. And, of course, the reason it turned out to be nothing is it got dealt with. You know, it got like the, like the ozone layer, the ozone hole, it got dealt with. Um, it's still a problem in certain places, but, you know, that idea of all of the European forests being destroyed by acid rain has actually been dealt with by really effective regulation and a reduction in sulfur and so on. So, you know, the, these things aren't myths. No, and um, the problem is, of course, that the the real solution is to rapidly d decrease our carbon dioxide emissions and to um, uh, the risk now is that we're not going to do it fast enough and people start to do things like geoengineering. Just quietly this week, um, some researchers in the United States started um, some some experiments in geoengineering, sprinkling particles mm. into the atmosphere. Cool. Which is, sounds what, what cool. What could possibly go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? And particularly when you're starting to influence the other people's atmospheres and, um, you know, you're doing things without the um, support or the cooperation of other countries. And, you know, this is, you know, potentially could make things worse. We don't know. And these are Absolutely. experiments in real time. Yeah. Uh, which which yeah. are a worry. The other it's thing funny. I was sorry. I was looking the other day, Bernard, at a at a wonderful story on a um, because I'm a bit of a nerd. There was a, something I was subscribed to, which um, 
is about aircraft, um, historic aircraft. And there was a, a Convair aircraft. Convair was a company that doesn't exist anymore. It's probably inside Lockheed Martin. But they created a nuclear, there, there was a proposal for a nuclear powered aircraft uh, in the 1950s. And so they, <laughs> they put a three, a three megawatt nuclear uh, reactor inside this convoy, convoy and flew it around for something like 200 hours. Um, not necessarily powering the aircraft, not actually power, powering the aircraft, but, um, you know, as a test for whether they could power the aircraft from it. And then they suddenly thought, hang on a minute, what happens if... <laughs> if we crash, yeah. <laughs> so these, you know, the, the, the law of unintended consequences is rather profound in all of these cases. Yes, I wouldn't want to be driving the fire engine at the airport when that one's coming, coming down. No, um, no. <laughs> Robert, you, you're, you've caught us. You've caught us ad libbing like mad on the climate because Catherine couldn't make it. Make it. Oh, in. I see. So I'm so we're so glad to see you, so that we don't have to ad lib, and certainly we won't be interrupting you. We're just going to give you the next forty five minutes entirely to yourself to do a, uh, a soliloquy. <laughs> well, that, on that would probably destroy the affairs. audience. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. They'd be pleased if I if I shut up and let you have the whole thing. So let's um, let's talk about um, Gaza this week and uh, where we are and and whether um, there is going to be a ceasefire and probably more importantly right now uh, whether Iran might actually um, attack Israel. Mm. Well, well it's really uh, the we've had a, a development in the last twenty four hours whereby the the political leader or the leader of the political wing of Hamas has had his three sons killed who are mm. operatives apparently in Hamas and mm. family members as well. So six people have been killed. And there was, spe there was speculation both in Israel and in the region that uh, there is a bit of a question going ricocheting around. Was this authorised by Netanyahu? Because mm. if so... Uh, there is a suspicion in Israel that Mr. Netanyahu doesn't want a ceasefire for political reasons. While the conflict's going, he's re relatively secure politically. Um, a ceasefire could be dangerous for him. This is the speculation. And of course, that's raised the question about the timing of this attack just after the CIA director, um, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Burns, has arrived in the region to participate mm -hmm. in talks. Uh, it looks like the Americans are putting a lot more into the talks. Um, but again, we are being treated to this spectacle where Mr. Biden continues to talk out both sides of his mouth, um, mm. calling, criticizing Netanyahu, but well, then re declining to, to cut off of arms. Most of the time, I yeah. Mm. And, um, but I think bit by bit, the signs are that Mr. Netanyahu, sorry, Mr. Biden is coming under immense pressure in the United States. It's interesting that chat shows like Jon Stewart, uh, mm. I don't know if you saw it, there's a piece on the social media which uh, uh, basically ridicules um, the administration's rhetoric about a rules-based order and the reality of America's involvement. Mm. Uh, and it makes some pretty tough reading, actually, but, it, it, as, of course, Stewart always delivers it with considerable plum and humour. Uh, but it will get home, and uh, it depicts America as weak, unable yeah. to walk the talk on key principles, and um, being pushed around in a partisan battle. Mm. Yeah, and Robert, let, me, let me just raise, raise an issue with you, because I apologised to you both last week afterwards, you know, this is letting the audience into our, our machinations. So, you know, I've failed to bring up this question of the... Israeli destruction of the of the Iranian uh, consulate in Damascus yeah. last week and killing several people from the uh, from the Revolutionary Guard. Oh, that is co of course the reason that Iran is now saying, you know, there will be a payback. There will be Israeli targets. You know, and people are talking about things like uh, the Buenos Aires um, synagogue bombing of several several years ago. It could be almost anywhere where these strikes against Israeli or Jewish targets are conducted. Mm. What do you think about this? Are we at the end? I speculated in my Substack thing today that we're sort of at the end of that plucky Israel period when Israel has kind of carte blanche to go and do anything it likes, in a sense, to something like the um, Iranian consulate in Damascus, and, you know, diplomat, you know, destroying, leveling diplomatic, a diplomatic mission. 
and then of course having deniability but everybody knows who's done it are we do you think strategically we're at the end of that phase now because of this well old, i think uh pariah state six months that on becoming or being six yeah i think six months on since the appalling hamas attack on israel i think a lot of the initial sympathy for israel's position has rapidly evaporated and i think israel now finds itself in a more sec insecure position than it was at the beginning of the crisis uh, it was a commentator sorry, recently in a said less, in a less secure position did uh, you sorry say? a less less secure position i beg your pardon hmm. um and uh, there was speculation by an american commentator that israel um if it had done nothing in response <laughs> to the attack by Hamas would probably be more secure now than it would be in the, the way it's acted because 33,000 plus. Excuse me. That's quite all right, Robert. It happens mm. to the best of us. Mm. 33,000 plus Palestinians have died, as we know, and the number's still rising. And I think even the liberal democracies who all seem to be having Israel's back, the UK, Australia, um, Canada, um, Germany, the United States. The United States alone seems to be hanging in there, but it's taking a very big mm. price now for the presidency sure of is. Mr. Biden. And that's very worrying for going forward because Mr. Trump doesn't have to do too much while this issue, the Gaza issue, is basically hemorrhaging Biden's support so rapidly. Mm. And it's, um, it's really important politically right now because uh, even though the economy is doing okay, America didn't yep. go into a recession, unemployment's relatively low, inflation is falling, but not quite fast enough. And people are feeling the inflation more than they used to in the past. And that means that Biden's uh, support, despite a strong economy, is quite weak in those um, swing states. Yep. Depending on which poll you look at, he's either ahead or behind Trump. Um, but also, it's interesting to me that Biden and America has um, corroded further its reputation globally. And yeah. I, I see that this week there's a push to, to have Japan join AUKUS in some form oh, or good another. Good segue, Bernard. Oh, yeah. uh, and, and of course, um, that's a live issue for us uh, yes. here uh, because we are also, in theory, um, thinking about and Judith Collins is in Washington talking about mm. whether to um, join up to August 2, whatever that is. Uh, what do you think then about, um, you know, New Zealand having to essentially bet on America's leadership in the world by joining? The well, group? let's be quite clear. The fundamental rationale of AUKUS is to defend and uphold the international rules based order in Indo-Pacific. Mm. Uh, and in that context, Gaza has done AUKUS no favours at all. Um, and of course, the biggest threat to the rules-based order, as seen in Washington and many other countries, and probably our own, is China, Chinese assertiveness, and we should have no illusions about that. But it does raise the question, given that the leading player in AUKUS cannot be consistent in its approach to upholding the rules-based order, I mean, the United States has provided four-fifths of the munitions that have killed all those mm. Palestinians um, and are probably complicit in war crimes. So, uh, you know, in that sense, I, I think the attractiveness of exploring the option of Pillar 2 may have contracted um, in, the view, in the eyes of many people. Uh, that what really came home to me was a commentary recently in the European newspaper was that the United States' position as the model liberal democracy, as it's often seen itself, has unfortunately, and I don't think many of us get any satisfaction out of this, has plummeted further since the beginning of the, the Gaza crisis. And what is interesting is that US, many of the institutions which the US has pioneered in the immediate post-war period, the International Court of Justice and the UN generally, um, these institutions are now being used to challenge US positions. I think about mm. the remarkable court case brought by South Africa, but now Nicaragua challenging Germany, support for Israel. 
Um, if only it were slightly more savoury countries doing it. Yeah, I mean, I'm not in any way condoning those countries, uh, particularly South Africa, which has a real blind spot for Mr. Putin's invasion mm. of Ukraine. But it, right. it's interesting that they are not prepared to sit back and just um, do nothing. And no. it seems to me that, unfortunately, the United States has given a tremendous boost to authoritarian states in the world, particularly, um, you know, countries like Iran, um, China and Russia. Uh, I never thought after the invasion of, of Ukraine, Russian diplomats would ever be in a position uh, to act as peace champions in any region of the world. But that's what they've done in um, um, so Robert, the Middle East. And that's a measure, I think, of diplomatic failure, unfortunately. So, Robert, speaking of um, cynicism, I was quite intrigued. And, and actually, I must admit, I, I kind of secretly admired... Uh, Winston Peter, the foreign foreign minister's reaction to Helen, former Prime Minister Helen Clark, although he missed the fact or ignored, chose to ignore the fact that um, Helen Clark was doing this in a in a joint statement or joint commentary with Don Brash mm. um, about the risks to New Zealand's independent foreign policy. I mean, it actually seemed to be, from her point of view and Don Brash's point of view, quite a good, relatively subtle fire across Winston and Judith's bows while also respecting Winston's right to say fuck off or please go away as when Simon yeah is. I mean I think I think Winston's on dangerous ground when he accuses people opposing or AUKUS of misleading or miss I, I let's be quite clear mm. it's not although he he did link his comments with Helen Clark um maybe mm. he's maybe he's you know not confining um the opponents of he's not confining his criticism to the opponents of AUKUS. Maybe he's including the AUKUS champions. I don't know. Um, but the, what we do, it, it, what the crucial thing here to keep in mind is that New Zealand, as a relatively small country, ha, is critically dependent in a way that the United States is not. Yeah. On a stable, rules-based international order, and the question is then: Is AUKUS the appropriate vehicle for help deliver that? And so what, what I found interesting about his comments, it was all about, oh, let's find out what's on offer. Well, actually, what is on offer that's going to make the strategy of AUKUS different? Because strategy, yeah. by the way, is, as Clausewitz has pointed out, is all about relating means to ends. But you don't, mm. <laughs> you don't sign a deal on the basis, oh, it's got some goodies in it for us. It's the goodies to help us do what? And so... Yeah. The and crucial as, thing here and as, is, and as, and as Edison said, strategy without without execution is hallucination. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, if if uh, Mr. Peters can make the case that AUKUS will help us strengthen the rules based order in the Indo Pacific, then maybe he's you know uh, he's got a case. But the other, when he talks about misleading, there's another little bit of. Um, thin ice that he has encountered here is that it's been government officials, including Mr. Peters himself, who joined us, a, a signed mm. a st joint statement with Miss Collins and their Australian counterparts. Remember that meeting of their mm. the Australian foreign and defence ministers back in the beginning of February. And in that joint statement, they said quite positively, but without too much foundation, that AUKUS has boosted regional security in the Indo-Pacific. Where's the evidence for that? Yeah, where's the evidence for that? Exactly. Well, we've done thin ice about 25 minutes ago when we were just um, preempting the <laughs> Catherine thing. But I'm going to do another segue with you and about this, actually, because it is interesting to think about Winston Peters being able to just say, you know, Helen Clark should pull her uh, head in. But actually, that seemed to be to be a really good intervention, an interesting part of what you might call a debate in open media between two well, between a former prime minister and a former leader of the opposition national party leader don brash and it's exactly the kind of semi intelligent dialogue that is at risk if we don't have a vibrant new zealand media other than the hoon of course which i know which is clearly the most vibrant new zealand media but what what do you make of this robert of this ability to actually have some serious conversations and ask people difficult questions well, I think it's great, and I think that's one of the great benefits. We often hear criticisms, and I join in sometimes, of you know the social media 
and how how polarizing it can be but it does provide opportunities sometimes to challenge policies in a way that was previously unavailable uh, yeah. helen clark you know like her or dislike her she is formidable on foreign policy and she does her homework and i think one of the reasons of irritation or the suggestion that she may be misleading the new zealand people which i don't think she is for one moment but it may have been a sign that the foreign minister was getting feeling a bit preempted yeah. uh, 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 exactly. uh, and also actually being held to account you know the the fact of the matter is um you know is even the members of AUKUS too, and this is very clear from discussions with Australians, are not quite sure what That's Pillar right. 2 is all about. Mm. And uh, right. obviously, it you yeah. know, it's an important question. And, and the other thing I'd like to say is that the United States at this point in time, with its reputation very compromised by what's happened in Gaza, would probably welcome a number of countries joining Pillar 2 to boost its legitimacy globally. And so New Zealand has to be very careful here. It has to be... I did like what um, Mr Peters said to the Chinese foreign minister um, when he met him in Wellington, that he wouldn't be influenced by Chinese pressure to stay out of AUKUS, but at the same time, he wouldn't be influenced by Allies' pressure to go in. Yeah, but I think, so I'm I think, hoping I he'll stick to that, but it needs to come through. Yeah, as as a segue to 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 Maria, um, really, it's also that we want strong New Zealand media, not just Helen Clark, to have these discussions. Um, so, I think what we need possibly is a is a Sunday evening uh, international affairs conversation between Robert Patman, Peter Bale, and Bernard Hickey. Um, we might just launch it online instead. But we're right. going to move to Maria now. R ratings it's a ratings bonanza that one so um uh, yeah Ma absolutely Ma uh, maria lovely to see you thank you very much for for joining us uh after a huge oh, thanks robert huge thank week you. for the media thank you robert a huge week for the media because not only um have we learned that we're well, seeing it confirmed that 380 journalists uh, will lose their jobs by my calculation that's about 20 percent of the journalists active at the end of last year uh, but also you've put out a, a big report on trust and the news media in New Zealand. Could you just remind us, uh, for those who haven't seen it, what that survey found? And uh, this survey, by the way, is, is not just um, a one-off dreamt up out of nothing. This is part of a, a, a global standard uh, set, up by, set up by the Reuters um, Institute. Um, so, Mary, what, what did you find? Yeah, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Bernard, I have really bad line, but I uh, hopefully you can hear me. We can. Uh, for some we reason, can. there's a lot. Yeah. So uh, uh, the trust report, uh, yeah, this was our fifth uh, trust in news report uh, in New Zealand. And uh, I'm, I'm sure you have seen that the results are grim. Uh, so in five years time, so we started this 2020, and in five years time, we have seen uh, the trust in news falling from 53 to 33 percent. So where we used to be five years ago, we used to be almost on the top of the trust. Uh, and I think mm -hmm. we were on the top of the trust in news. We are now almost in the bottom with the UK and the USA. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Uh, and the, the other findings, key findings were there that news avoidance is growing. So people are avoiding more news and more often. Uh, but the the Paradoxically, the people are also consuming or very interested in news. So there's you know kind of you know, mixed signals there. Yeah. What did you make? What did you make, Mary? Of the, I mean, we seem to have in your survey the highest news avoidance of anywhere in the world that you've that surveyed by you or the Reuters Institute. What what do you did you think that was an aberration, or is there what's, well, what's particu particularly happening? I don't here? know. So, uh, you know, I, I really wanted to understand Jesus, you're the academic, on. you're supposed to know everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you are the journalist, you're supposed to do, <laughs> do your homework. 
<laughs> so, so, uh, so, yeah. So, uh, the the we know some reasons why the people are avoiding the news. So that, of course, comes from the survey, and people are saying, "I'm avoiding the news that you know because it's all gloom and doom, and it's biased, and news is opinionated, and, and you name it." Uh, but why are we so high compared to others? I don't know. So this is something that we uh, we are conducting further studies and we're doing focus groups and try to understand this all a bit more because it's there are a lot of complexities and you you know that this is you know the people are talking about how they perceive things. It's not a uh, it doesn't tell us how much or what they actually are doing. It's more mm -hmm. sort of you know the how they perceive things. So I I don't know uh, answer to that question, Peter. Maria, let, let me ask you, and it's, and it's a question that uh, our, our listener or uh, Paul Kennedy is asking as well. I'm I'm going to slightly twist his the way he's put it is, as I understand it from your survey and particularly the the wider broad global Reuters Institute one. There's a tremendous correlation in the way they move with trust in government. Um, that if you've got countries with a high yeah, trust the, in the, government, the, the, you have a high is... trust in media. Are we breaching, are we breaking from that in New Zealand or is this a loss of faith in all institutions? Yeah, there's, you know, yeah, thanks for that. Uh, I think the, it's the, there is a wider issue uh, that uh, we talk about that, that social contract between the people uh, and uh, the news media and the people has been broken and then that people don't trust the other social institutions like the, the media, uh, I'm sorry, government, uh, politicians, businesses, etc, etc. Um, what is, uh, I think, is happening here that, you know, in my mind, the sort of underlying feeling and the uh, from this survey is that people are losing the trust in information they see. So it's not just that the you know the, the social institutions etc. they are not trusting, but it's that they don't trust anymore what the information uh, they see because mm. they give us they give us a comments that well okay I read the news and then I go and uh, check my own facts with my social media experts so uh so so we don't of course know you know who their social media experts are but that they don't trust the information at all and of course we all know these political attacks don't help uh, and uh, we know that we have had uh, strong uh, attacks from the politicians or certain politicians uh, um, thousand media and in that Reuters survey they say that there's a strong correlation with this uh, this high level of media criticism and unfair media mm -hmm. criticisms coming from the politicians and then trust in news. Yeah. If that makes sense. But Maria, what, one, of the, one of the markets that has very high trust in media is um, Finland. And I think you may have some experience of the Finnish media market. Um, could you make some comparison perhaps between... I mean, we, heard, we had Christopher Luxon the other day talking about Lithuania, Estonia, Scandinavia, you know, various Scandinavian countries and Baltic countries that he thought we should compare ourselves against. What's the comparison with Finland and New Zealand on media, please? Well, you know, the, the I'm always biased because I always talk about the Scandinavia and Finland, which is my, you know, uh, where I'm from originally. Uh, uh, but I, uh, I think what is uh, Behind that, I think it's there is a, a very strong uh, tradition uh, in news and news reporting, but also we have a really strong public uh, in, a public interest uh, broadcaster, Ule, which is like Radio New Zealand here, and people do like it or, and they trust it. So I think that that kind of notion of that, and the people have that notion that they own that, uh, that um, uh, uh, Ule's Radio, which is Radio in New Zealand, mm -hmm. because they pay that tax also for it. So I think they take sort of ownership and they trust it somehow. Mm -hmm. I think it comes to that model as well. Just finally, uh, Maria, um, I'm curious about what you think this week's um, announcements about the closures of News Hub, of Sunday and Fair Go will, um, will mean for how people consume news, whether they trust it, um, and whether it might change uh, uh, the trajectory of, of where we're going. 
Well, it's uh, awful news, of course, uh, if you're thinking about 370-something jobs in news production and journalism and media are going. Uh, it's definitely not the good news at the time when I I think, and uh, and I think many other people think that, you know, we need to trust it and verify the information now more than ever because that... Uh, uh, misinformation, disinformation is still, you know, uh, rampant on the social media platforms, especially. Uh, where do we go from here and how does it look? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm sure that, you know, in the media normally we have these cycles that, you know, you have a massive layout and something pops up and uh, comes back from there. Um, I don't know uh, it, how that's going to... Uh, in the end, it comes to the business model. There are some er encouraging signs in terms of paying for news. And uh, like our report shows that, you know, people are actually... We are among the third highest countries for paying for news, digital news. And uh, I think the NZME figures today, uh, or the, what came from the annual meeting, uh, also showed that, you know, they now actually can, with the, those digital subscriptions, pay for their which journalism. Which is amazing. Yeah. Which is amazing and, uh, and encouraging. So, so I have this feeling that maybe we have lost everything, you know. So maybe there's a glimmer of hope. Maria, let me ask I'm you open. two super fast questions, because Bernard's just about to have a, have a connection. Yeah. Um, Catherine Voyles in our audience asks, does Finland have talkback radio? <laughs> yeah, yes, I, 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 assume, I assume so. I haven't been living there like a 30 odd year, so I'm not sure. Okay. And the, um, other, the other question is David, David Mooring, who's, very, who's a regular person on our crew, is asking, um, what was the, what was, how did you gather the responses to your survey and did you over-index on grumpy people? Sorry, uh, that I lost that. On question. your survey, in in doing mm. your survey, is it possible that you over-indexed on the grumpy? Uh no, I don't think so. Yeah, it comes. You know, we 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 went we went through with a comb with the six hundred comments, and they are grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. But at least we're not. No, no. Thank you very much, you, Mary. Thank Lovely to have you on. Thanks. That's, that's great. And it's um, Thank you. fantastic to, uh, uh, we've had Mary on before and we're really pleased to have Holly on again as well. Holly Bennett from Afi Group, who is the owner of a communications and public relations firm. Um, and You is... always make us feel better when you're on, Holly. I do? Yeah. yeah. No, no, it's, you, it's... You, you, make us, you make us feel as though there are you know, young thrusters coming up who are, you know, doing good things. And, oh, and it's, well, I, I hope I'm doing good things. I try to do good things, Peter. <laughs> that's right. No, it's, it's lovely to see you. And in particular, um, this week we've uh, seen some of the news out of the uh, lobbying sector. You know, you have been looking to bring in a voluntary code of practice and to lift the levels of um, uh, respect and um, and control for this for the sector um, because it's unregulated at the moment and unlike in other countries where there are rules stopping people jumping from one uh, from the public sector to the private sector just back and forth um, what are what are we learning now because of course with fewer journalists around um, the lobbyists uh, are able to do more work maybe in a, in a quiet place so can you tell us what what you thought what you think of this new lo lobbying code I mean, it's the art of the lobbyists to always be able to do work in a quiet place, right? And I know that we yeah. touched on that last time. Is that mm. probably why I'm arguably not your usual lobbyist? Because I tend to be quite noisy and everyone knows where I am. But I think one of the things that we've seen recently is essentially uh, lobbyists being effectively, effective lobbyists in terms of their not wanting to have any accountability or transparency principles. So I sort of put a line in the sand earlier in the year, and I thought this direction that it's heading is not really good enough, at least not for me, as the owner of my firm. And my firm's come out and released 12, 12 principles, uh, which include an integrity principle, conflicts of interest principle, and most importantly, a transparency principle. So we are open and upfront, and all our clients are on our website right now. So as someone in communications and PR, I mean, how important is it, do you think, to have a fourth estate which is able to question, to um, hold people accountable, but, but also to do things that maybe the, the, you know, the, the first estate and the second estate, government, the courts, um, can't necessarily do? It's 
so important. Like, the, one of the overarching rules of everything that we do in my firm is to do the um, DOM post test. If we do this and it ends up on the front page of the DOM post, will we be able to uh, justify it? And I think that people who are that arrogant to think that they, they shouldn't be bound by that is why we have a lot of these transparency discussions happening. Because there are people who do seem to think that they're above accountability, and quite frankly, no one is. And it's interesting that there's been a... Um, a, a large increase in the number of people who are there to protect reputations within companies, within uh, government departments, where maybe they weren't there in the past. Mm -hmm. And you do wonder um, whether the um, the uh, the arms race, if you like, between um, the um, the PR industrial complex inside companies and journalists is, uh, has really tilted in, in favour of the, the PR industrial complex. Um, not so much in the promoting things, but in the keeping things out. Yeah, I mean, the fact that uh, professionalisation of any industry is not a bad thing, but professional uh, obscure, obscuring is probably something that we all need to be a little bit more attuned to. I think there's a, a, a somewhat an element of naivety in our country that it's not going on and people are not getting in front of stories in certain ways to direct narrative. And so that is the importance of the fourth estate to ask not just the second question, but the third question, the fourth question. And when something doesn't pass the gut test, keep asking those questions. Because nine times out of 10, when your gut is telling you something, you've got to keep following it, right? <laughs> Yeah, and I'm curious too, um, you know, lobbyists um, can be very effective when they're, they're able to present a, a bunch of policies, particularly to a new government, who, you know, maybe are scrambling around for something to plug into the gap, or maybe they've, they've got a particular view. And could you give us an idea of, you know, how people behind the scenes are able to work with ministerial officers, um, the people who are drawing up legislation and policies, how that works. Because we've seen some really interesting things around the, um, the cigarettes uh, lobby and how that's translated into policy in recent months. And I'd be curious to know from someone who's, you know, uh, who's seen how this works, whether um, that's, there's a lot of success at the moment for, for those people who want to get their policies through. Yeah, well, I mean, arguably the tobacco stuff while the outcome may be seen as successful, I'd say it's, it's arguably very unsuccessful mm. because we're talking about it. And actually that's created a, like a, a sheen of what is actually going on. And I think the second thing to note is that uh, the Labour Leaders Office has got OAAs in with all ministerial departments on a number of lobbying firms, my own mm. included. Mm. So shortly the public is going to see exactly what it is that I do on a day-to-day -day basis <laughs> and I'm not particularly exercised about it in any way, shape or form. I think when people, you can't plausibly point to the things that people are doing as professional lobbyists is when you have start to have the question right and this is where we get this murkiness of why having trust in what you do as a lobbyist aka you can point to what the chain was therefore where the communication points were and how things came to be is why transparency is so important and when you can't yeah holly that, may i just challenge a tiny tiny point of that because yeah. of course what what is so a little bit different in New Zealand is that, and as we see with the tobacco questions, those people are already insiders. And so they're, the people that they're representing know who they are. They know their previous political connections. They're already part of a club so that, you know, you almost don't have to do the lobbying. And then, I mean, I'm interested to know what you think. A lot's been made, for example, of this group Atlas, which I think um, uh, Robert... Um, Gibbs from Gibbs Farms' daughter was involved in, and um, um, Seymour was, you know, connected to it. And various, and, and you see people from the taxpayers' union will say, "Oh, but Atlas spends almost no money," and so on. That isn't the point. It's actually pervasive influence is the point at remarkably little cost. Well, I mean, but that that ultimately pervasive influence is something that doesn't really matter 
where we're talking so it happens everywhere across every industry it happens across the media industry it happens everywhere so it's whether or not the people on the other side that are being influenced whether or not they're going Understand. to let that take over them their principles the things they stand for all of that kind of stuff and that is where for me Lots of people know me, it doesn't mean they necessarily agree with me, and it also means I might know a lot of these ministers from having once been a ministerial advisor, and they are mm. now ministers. Now, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily gonna agree with me. Hey, I might know a little bit more about them because where they've been in the past, what their views may be, but ultimately, politicians are the ones that have to make the decision. The thing that I am saying is for me is that when we're talking about a transparency principle, when you cannot point to the link, so you can't figure out how it got there, yeah, that is exactly. Where you need well, to I think that's it. okay. So, okay, so, so much as you know, much as I think you're terrific, I think that's exactly what has uh, been achieved by this this group so far. And of course, there's that famous line that you know, I've got principles, and if you don't like those, I've got others. Hundred <laughs> percent. I, I know. I'm well familiar. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Holly, um, uh, you're really familiar with, you know, how power is exercised and how uh, power is held accountable through the parliamentary process. And you talked just briefly there about Official Information Act requests from the opposition leader's office to people in government and people those around. They come out, they might come up in a, you know, a question time question to a minister or maybe come out in press release. But sometimes there are things that both the government and the opposition maybe don't want everyone to know. Um, and really, uh, do, how, how, how important is it for the, for the journalists to get involved and do this, the work from the start themselves? Because um, we're all guilty of you know, getting a really juicy press release that comes through copying and pasting and putting it up. But how, how, how important is it to actually be in the process as a, as a journalist and trying to understand this stuff? I think it kind of there's a few things to unpack but one of them i will touch on is that when you think about the professional pr industry which means that journalists is onslaught with pr press releases and things like that sometimes it really is easy to not do the uh, really in-depth questioning behind the press releases and then obviously that's the job to make it sort of a little bit murky so you'll ask as little questions as possible and you will you know report what we would like you to report because you know that's what what we do too we put out press releases hoping that people will pick stuff up um, but I do think that when you when it comes down to it we always have to be interrogate it's like that old line follow the money if you're constantly having a look at where the money and therefore the influence and those two are very closely linked anyone that says that they're not it's not it's not living in reality as far as i'm concerned if they're not looking at the money therefore the influence and you know then we're not getting a really good look at from the fourth estate as to what's going on and that is why for me having really good investigative journalists who don't just have to follow a story and file something every two days or three days that can look at things over a long period of time or, or six a day <laughs> yeah. 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 do you know what i mean that's why that's so important because we journalists have changed the trajectory of this country they always have they always will that is why they're so important there has to be a balance on the side of on the other side of power otherwise it's like you another saying absolute power corrupts absolutely holly it's wonderful to have you on thank you so much um to shine light on this issue from a different place we're now um happy to have join us one of those journalists who uh, is um an investigative journalist who has spent uh, long hours um, bringing things to light, but also done things quickly as well, both inside Parliament and outside it. Patty Gower uh, from uh, News Hub, um, and someone who actually uh, worked from an office right next to me in Parliament for many years and is, um, is going to join us shortly. Uh, uh, and who from seems his, to be, from seems to be broadcasting from a chicken a chicken factory in Pukekawa somewhere there. No, no, the I, I think um, I think that's actually the news the news hub offices. Um, I know that you can see into the ceilings, yes. uh, which we're going to have um, we're going to have them shortly. I'm just going to send him a quick uh, text message to say. Can hey Bernard, can I just also blow a little yep. bit of smoke up your bottom, as it were, um, metaphorical smoke, not because. When I was thinking, I was thinking about you today and our work uh, when you joined FT Market Watch with me in the year 2000, and I pulled you out of Reuters um, to do that. You did incredible work 
on judging you know what that organization was like and i just want to say in that area that 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 holly was talking about people can rely on you to really do the work patty good hair yeah oh, thank you yeah i didn't i didn't um tv3's already shut down the makeup <laughs> and grooming i just went down yeah, excellent um, i just cool. went down to see them guys and it's already closed uh, oh, so wow. that's, why the, that's wow. why the here it is hi, hi peter hi well Bernard. you're looking Thanks. terrific so and you've also had a hell of a busy day um uh, i heard you on the wireless this morning and then i heard then i heard about you from watching uh mike hosking yes um, would you like to say some swear words because then um, Simon will have more swear words to edit out instead of just me. <laughs> no, it was pretty interesting actually. It was my first time um, on a morning media run, which you often see the um, the politicians do. And obviously, I, um, you know, when I worked in the press gallery with Bernard, we'd both be uh, around our computers or whatever, listening to, to to the prime minister or the leader of the opposition go from media organisation to media organisation. Yeah. Um, it was my first time doing it. And actually, I've got a bit of newfound respect um, uh, <laughs> for the prime minister or, or leaders of the opposition because it's, it's relatively hard work. Um, you know, each yeah. um, organisation, ZB, Morning Report, um, I, I was on TVNZ Breakfast and the TVNZ Building for the first time, and each interview has a really different complexion and change, and, and you can prepare all you like, but actually they do kind of come in on different in different ways. Um, and it, is, it is pretty hard on your it is pretty hard on your brain i found it really really quite tough this morning yeah and that's that's interesting live television interviews are where you actually see a journalist a, not just a journalist but a politician or a ceo really on their own and we get to see what they really think when they don't have a chance to check it with a pr person or make sure the lawyers looked at it um and that is a really valuable thing and this week we learned that news hub is going to close down so not just all of those those great interviews that are done in the morning shows um that get put into the um the normal uh news bulletins but of course the nation uh which um which you've, you've been on and and produced how, how important is it do you think that that news hub is closing down yeah i reckon it's huge um for new zealand i i i think you know i'm i'm here at news hub at the moment it's a taonga you know last night there's fantastic stories broken um down in the south island from juliet speedy about yeah. a fraudster there's another one tonight you know these are just the tiny examples and i say tiny not to not to demean juliet's stories um but tiny because they're they're small everyone wants to talk about oh well you know all the big things that happen but you know juliet's broken two amazing stories in two nights um out of 365 nights a year um, it all adds up. You take this away, um, and that all goes. You know, the nation. You take that away. That's a whole lot of interviewing and a whole lot of layers of of information that's uncovered, that's taken away. And I kind of think of the media um, as an ecosystem. You know, each bit of it feeds into another bit. And it might just be that someone actually gets a no comment from someone on the nation, but the next person's able to see that no comment and realise that when someone says something on it that means something then a columnist is able to pick up on it and write a bit more about that and then people read that column and then later on in parliament the next week they put that into the thing and then mm -hmm. it all rises you know so so that's the way that i look at it is that the media is like a like an ecosystem and if we're going to take one big massive species uh, to carry on with it out of the ecosystem you know the whole thing is going to be affected um uh, uh, like that and that's that's my worry um with news hub is that actually here we are we're going to really mess um with the new zealand media ecosystem mm. by taking something mm. big out of it and we're going to remove all of these downstream effects that it's been having that we don't know what were you hoping it's a really um, interesting aspect of this patty is the, is the sorry for Robin, is the catalyst catalyst can I ask, we, we had Mira Mialati on from AUT before talking about the trust report and I, I was very interested that ACT weaponized that yesterday by putting out a statement, you know, pointing out the lack of trust and saying, do you, know, do you trust the media to represent us, which was extremely tasteless, I thought. What, what has the media done wrong as well, though, Paddy, to get to the position that we're in? What, what do yeah. you, not necessarily you personally, but what, no, what, no, no, what no, is the self-criticism that we need to apply as well? Yeah, and I Thanks, think it's buddy. a really good it's a really good question because um, 
her work is really, really important and it is telling us something. You know, it is telling us that we've got a branding and perception problem out there with a number of people, okay? And we've got to acknowledge that. I've got to acknowledge that. Um, News Hub's got to acknowledge that. Other journalists working in the mainstream media have got to acknowledge that there is this problem out there. And we can't sort of just shut it away and say, hey, um, Mm. um, this isn't anything, we've got to take it on. Um, But at the same time, I think we've got to be very careful with conflating it with what's happened here at News Hub. Now, mm-hmm. trust me, I've been involved at all different levels. I was on the committee that worked with the worked with the company to um, come back with a counter proposal. Um, I've seen a lot of, of 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 their workings and 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 the kind of reasons why they've why they've taken the decision to shut us down. And it's very separate to the trust issue. You know, it's 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 to do with revenue it's to do with um, the ability to get revenue out into the future it's it's it trust isn't kind of coming into it Warner Brothers Discovery isn't saying hey people have lost trust with you and you guys are now losing but money Patty, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that the audience and advertisers that this is that there is I'm personally convinced from everything I've seen overseas and everything in the, that there is a link between trust and and the finances of this I mean do, are we not you know, we're, we're introspective at times of crisis, but are we not introspective at the rest of the time about about why some of these things are happening, or what we what might be in our power to ch- make a difference? Yeah, and I think we we um, we need to be open about it, and we need to go. Okay, so how do we get back and reach these people and show them that we can be trusted? Um, how can we build out the people that tr- that, that 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 trust us as well? Um, you know what? What do we need to do? And I think um, something, and I spoke about this yesterday. Um, two things that I believe um, we need to be really optimistic about the future of the media. Um, we can't get too down on ourselves and sort of too worried about all of these external forces, as scary as they might be. And we've got to, as journalists um, and people working in the media, be optimistic. Um, and leaders in the media, like yourselves and myself, because we are looked to as leaders, we've got to be optimistic about what we can do. The other thing, we have to consistently work with purpose. So work with yep. purpose, where we show people that we are driven by some by some greater greater purpose. Um, and, and Paddy, and, would you, let me let me just tell you, because Bernard's going to ask you a final question in a minute. But one of our readers, one of our listeners, says, uh, Bernard or Peter, can you ask Paddy? If he could continue his wonderful work on a paid platform similar to the car cut, which is Bernard's thing. So, so Bernard, Bernard and I will be making a proposal to you about coming in as a co co host. But, you know, you, you... yeah. Um, but I do want to say to that person, um, um, and, I, and, I, and I, spoke, um, uh, I spoke to a large group down in Wanaka um, at the weekend as well about these issues, um, and a person in the audience asked a very similar question. And I want to say to this person, actually, you know, um, watch this space, um, because what Bernard's doing with the kaka, um, you know, it is something real, it's something different, it's something new, um, and and it is a and it is a way that that quality media can survive. And I've taken notice of that, and I would like to be, um, you know, in this current situation I'm in, um, you know, if there is a way where I can go out and be part of a vanguard. Of Kiwi journalists who are doing things in a different way and starting to push new models out there, that would be absolutely awesome, and that would be um, part of that kind of leadership and working with a purpose. If we're, if I'm out there um, working right. in a way where I can show, hey, there's different ways of doing this, and what I like about the Kaka model, and I know I'm probably talking all over your time and everything, but it's hard to get airtime from oh, someone really? like me these days. So you <laughs> yeah, um, um, you know, what the Kaka model when we're talking about working with purpose and building trust, you know, Bernard's got a community there, okay, and and he's able to expand that community. He's able to work with that community and be close to that community, and they can actually that relationship of trust develops more. Okay, so if we're building more communities like that out in this ecosystem that we need to rebuild, we need to rebuild the New Zealand ecosystem as well, we're basically building communities of trust out there. That's what what Bernard's model is. Um, So that actually fits back into what I'm talking about. We need to get back out and trust them. Actually, what the CARC is doing is getting closer to our people than ever before um, and getting more trust from them. So there's an argument here. Jesus Christ, you've learned a lot in the last couple of months. 
the people yeah. what the people watching us right now and subscribing to Bernard trust him more than any other journalist ever before in New Zealand because they're actually paying him individually for what he does. The ultimate symbol of trust almost, other than marrying someone, um, is paying them. Okay. So um, quite a you know, few of them want to get, get, quite a few of them want to marry him as well. <laughs> uh, just just one. Um, Patty, just just to thank you very much. And I I um, am a huge admirer of the work you've done in uh, trying something new and essentially doing journalism in a way that um, is really different. The Paddy Gower Has Issues uh, series on television shocked everyone, I think, in journalism and in television because it was journalism that was massively popular and yeah. went to some areas and places that were uncomfortable, enlightening, and I'm sure actually made change happen. In fact, just in the last couple of weeks, there's been a, a, a little policy win on a particular issue that you've been dealing with. And um, I too will join with the audience and um, uh, w wish you well in trying to uh, develop further that, those communities and that, those ju that journalism and, and, around Patagonia. And Patagonia if not, there's a place issues. in a bookshop for you with me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, yeah, no, we, we, we hope you're able to continue to develop that. Pa Patty, yeah, thank no, you no. very much. Thank you very much. Wonderful to have you on. Thanks again. Good luck. Um, go well. And thank you too to um, Peter Bale from a bookshop in Hume Bay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so talk much, you soon, guys. Patty. All right. Okay. Talk you soon. Are we going to shut down, Bernard? We are going to shut or down. Are we going to do the? Are we going to do the skateboarding dog? Do Do you have a skateboarding dog? Well, it was it was the little story in the Guardian this week about the. Do you remember Shrek, the sheep in the South Island that got discovered? There's a, oh. there's one in Woody. One in Australia called Woody, that uh, you know had been discovered after many many years um, with a gigantic um, fleece, and the guard, somebody at the Guardian uh, did the headline, on the lamb. <laughs> Very good. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah, almost See as good. At, no, 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 hang on. I've got one. I've yeah. got one. Oh, it's yeah. it's too okay. too good. Speaking of really bad puns involving sheep. Um, I don't know if you saw that footage of a whole group of sheep um, going down the main street of Tikawili this week that took a, a wrong turn into the car park of the Liquorland and went straight for the door, all of them. Um, it was a ram raid. Oh, very good. <laughs> See you later. Catch you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.